Thank you, Brother Dalton. Have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter number one tonight. Matthew chapter number one. As we continue to look at our series on Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. The reason for this season. Matthew chapter one. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. As we look tonight at the response, another response. Throughout the Christmas story, there are a number of characters with a number of different responses. All of which I believe, because they're in the inspired Word of God, can provide some help and some truth and some real life experience and real life direction for you and for me. We looked on Sunday, on Sunday night, of the response of the wise men. And to sum up in two words, the response of the wise men would be this follow it. Whatever God says, follow it. Nice and easy. Can you say that with me? Follow it. Can you get that? Can you memorize that? Try it again. Look at that. You got it already. A lot easier said than done, though, isn't it? A lot easier. And a lot easier for, to instruct someone else in that than to do it yourself. Easier to say to your, your friend or to your daughter or your, your spouse, say, you follow it. But me, that's, that's a different story. Well, tonight in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse number 18, I'd like us to look at the response of Joseph. Joseph, a key a key character in the Christmas story. Sure, he didn't play the same role as Mary. Of course, we know that. He definitely wasn't the baby Jesus, and he wasn't the Holy Ghost. But Joseph, what a key character to the Christmas story. In fact, without the heritage of Joseph, Jesus could not rightfully sit on the throne. But because of the heritage of Joseph, the son of David, of the ruling line, Jesus could then sit on the throne. So let's look in verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 1, where the Bible says this, this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. You see, a Jewish Marriage in those days had, I, I am told, three phases. They had the initial, I like you, you like me phase. Then they'd have the betrothal, the espousing, that's what the Bible says, phase. That's the phase that Mary and Joseph were in. It, it would be kind of like a present day engagement, but a whole lot more serious. When I was in Bible college, many couples seemed to get engaged, and as equally as many couples seemed to break off their engagement. I'd go down to the post office area where the, where, the, where the boxes were, and you'd see on the sign, the little, for, little people would post for sale signs, and you'd see this kind of sign, diamond engagement ring. Another couple bit the dust. Reasons like, well, it's not the will of God, it's not you, it's me, I don't have peace about it, things like that. End of the day, the result being the same. The couples had broken off their engagement before, and, and the... the while it's traumatic and while it's a big deal, it was a much bigger deal in Bible times. This particular stage, this phase of the marriage, the betrothal, the espousal stage, if they were to break it off, it would be as if they broke off their marriage. The same proceedings for a divorce would have to be taken for this particular stage as well. It was not just a, I don't like you, or I don't feel good about this, or boy, it's just not going to work out any longer. No, this was a big deal. And a huge deal that, that now Mary was pregnant. Look, please, in verse number 19, then Joseph, her husband... You see, they're not quite married yet, but in that culture, they were as good as married Though they were not come together as husband and wife yet, they were in the eyes of everyone around, in parents and friends, the community, they were essentially husband and wife, though they were not quite there yet. They had not given the vows yet. It had not taken place. That's why the Bible says, in Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a sincere and honest man, a, a thoughtful man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her way privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." 
Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's kind of our foundation for the series during this season. God with us. What a tremendous, what a captivating, what a humbling thought that the God of the universe, the creator of mankind, or the creator of everything that we see, the one who is in control of all things, would deem himself and humble himself to be among us. God with us. And then look at verse number 24 and 25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. I'd ask for your help. Lord, I ask you to illuminate your word, that this principle, this idea, this concept, this truth would touch us. Lord, I ask that if there's someone here who needs to be touched by your word, that tonight they'd respond to you. Lord, may we learn from your servant Joseph. Thank you for your son Jesus who came to earth to die for our sins. Lord, bless this time now. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. On Sunday, we looked at the wise man. We could sum up the wise man in two words. Those two words were? Try it one more time. Those two words were? Follow it. All right, one more time. I know when we test, but let's try one more time. Those two words for the wise men are follow it. For Joseph, there's also two words we have. I'll give you those two words, then I'll fill out the sermon. If you decide to leave after I give you those two words, I don't have a problem with that as long as you do these two words. Fair enough? You see, we want to pull out early and not listen to what God says or uh, not apply what God says the wise men, they were to follow it. Joseph was to obey it. Can you say that with me? Obey it. One more time. Obey it. See, you're doing great. We could go home now, except we're not quite there yet. Joseph obeyed God in a difficult situation. And I want tonight to look at this situation and some truths from here that I think and I believe will be a help to us. We can think of lots of excuses why we don't have to obey God. I have three children. They have lots of reasons why they don't want or have to or think they don't need to do our instructions. I worked for 12 years at Bridgeport Baptist Academy as a school principal, and I have heard countless excuses from parents why their children didn't have to follow what was set in place, and students alike. We all have excuses. Maybe you've been pulled over by a police officer before. When he asked, why were you going this fast? A foolish question. We all have a reason. Well, you see, officer, I was, or I need to, or I'm about to. I'm on my way to. I forgot this. I didn't know. A little while back, I was helping my wife, or about a year and a half ago now, paint her classroom. Some people there. And I had my, my vehicle and a trailer on the back of it, and my work clothes on. And I'm right there by Sherwood Elementary, where my wife teaches. And uh, unbeknownst to me, there's some police officers officers that sit right on the edge of the township. Also unbeknownst to J.D. Howell, the speed limit goes down from about 45 to 35 miles an hour. I kept going my merry way at 47 miles an hour. And before I knew it, this, little, this car behind me turned on his lights. I pulled into right there in the corner of Mackinac and I think it's Shattuck Case Funeral Home. Right in distance of my wife and my children who could see their dad getting pulled over. Oh, the shame. Not nearly as much shame as the one day I thought I was going to get pulled over on this property. I was on my motorcycle coming around that corner there. And like I was apt to do, I tended to wrap it in first gear. Now, it only go to 20-something miles an hour in first gear. It's 20-something. This particular day, I didn't wrap all the way up. Jason Papo remember this day. And as I came down that curve, I wrapped it, shifted, wrapped it. And I see this vehicle up ahead looks like a Tahoe, dark colored Tahoe. As I come right past the Boyke's house right there, he turned on his lights. It's about 3.30, time for soccer practice. And I thought, oh, good Lord, I'm going to get pulled over in the church parking lot in front of all the young people. Well, I do like any good citizen. I pulled into the church. 
And he kept on going. The Lord is good. I was shocked he pulled me over for going 20-something on, on King Road. <laughs> Apparently it's slower than 20-something on that road. But not this day. I got pulled over cases right where my wife and children could see me. Uh, unlike the time that my wife got pulled over on Dixie Highway, the kids in the back seat, one of them began to cry as Doreen got pulled over and said, Mommy, are you going to jail? <laughs> not this day. He walks up to my vehicle and he says, you know, license, registration, I gave him that. So he said, well, what are you doing, sir? I said, well, I'm going to help my, my wife paint her classroom. She's a new teacher at Sherwood Elementary. In fact, she's right over there. You can see her standing outside the building. And, uh, and he said, you know how fast you were going? I said, yes, sir. I was going probably about 47 miles an hour. He said, you're going exactly 47. He goes, why are you going so fast? And I have a good excuse. I can think of them quickly. But I, I actually had one that day. I said, well, sir, I said, to be quite honest with you, this is the situation. I said, I come from Bridgeport. I said, I don't come on this side of town, all right? I don't like this side of town. I didn't say that. I said, I don't come this side of town very often. I said, in Bridgeport, most things are 45 miles an hour. I was not even paying attention to the speed limit. I was going, to, assuming it was 45 miles an hour, and as you see, going 47. He said, well, and apparently, whether he thought it was true or not, I sold it well. He looked across there and saw the, you know, the kids. I think they were cheering, not crying that day. <laughs> See, they love more their mom or their dad. But uh, we always have an excuse, though, why, why it doesn't apply to us, why the rules don't apply to us. If you don't think you have excuses, then the next time you walk past a wet paint sign, make sure you stick your hands in your pocket. Wet paint. I'm not so sure it's wet doesn't look wet to me. It could be wet. doesn't smell wet. It's a little shiny, just a little touch. Huh. Sure enough, it's wet. <laughs> Did you touch that? Well, I was just seeing if it was wet. The sign says wet paint. Well, I wasn't sure if the sign was right or not. We all have an, a reason. And if we're not careful, we will do the same thing to God's instructions. We will give a reason why we don't have to obey them. Oh, they're good for somebody else. They're good for our brother. They're good for our sister. They're good for a parent. They're good for a child. They're good for the church. They're good for our Sunday school class. They're good for the choir member, but they don't apply to me. And I want you tonight from God's Word show how Joseph, in the midst of a terrible situation, a hard one in his perspective at first, did not make an excuse, but merely obeyed what God told him to do. That's why, my friend, if you leave after that, I'm okay, as long as you do that. As long as you commit in your heart, submit to the Lord and say, God, whatever you speak to me about, I will obey it. Would you say one more time those two little words that describe what Joseph did obey? Would you say that with me? Obey it. I'd like to notice three things tonight. First of all, we see there was a public disgrace. Verse number, nine, verse number 18 and 19. The Bible says that Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She was discovered to be with child. I looked at this and I noticed a couple of things. I noticed in this situation, it was a public disgrace. It was a humiliating situation. The Bible says that Mary was found with child. Mary didn't find herself with child. She knew she was with child. The angel had told her that. We find that account in Luke chapter number 1. But Joseph, Joseph found out that Mary now is going to have a baby. In this particular society back then and, and ours a little bit, not as much as it was before, a disgrace to be an unwed mother. And while at first you could hide it, there would, be, there would come a point when Mary could not hide this any longer. Newsflash, it's hard to hide when you're pregnant. I've said this sometime before, but at church, please, people, if you think someone's pregnant, don't ask them. If you're not sure... There's another two little words you can use. The wise men are following. Joseph's obey it. You can shut it. <laughs> now keep you out a whole lot of trouble, a whole heap of trouble. I told you about the time that someone thought my wife was pregnant. She wasn't. 
That day or, or around that time, she'd ask me in the morning when she put on this particular outfit, she goes, honey, do I look pregnant? My wife is as slender as, as someone can be. I said, no, honey, you don't look pregnant. All right, that was not just man talk or husband talk. That was honest talk. Honey, you don't. Well, a little, a little ride around the bus route that day put her hands on my wife and said, Miss, how are you pregnant? My wife said, J.D., are you lying to me? No, honey, I'm not lying to you. My wife gets to church either that day or shortly thereafter that, and, a, and an elderly man comes up to her church. And this church right here, First Baptist Church, says, are you pregnant? She says, no, but you're the second one to say something about that. I think, and he cuts her off and he says, oh, just fat then. My wife never wore that outfit again. <laughs> she never asked me any questions either. <laughs> I, I don't care how old you are, there's some things better left unsaid. But here was a disgraceful situation, a humiliating situation to Joseph. Imagine Joseph here, a, a just man, and the Bible tells us he was an honest, he was sincere, he was a man of character and integrity, and to find out that Mary, his loved almost to be wife, but pretty much in the eyes of the culture, wife, and though he had been honest with her, and he had not crossed any immorality, that, that, and he knew that before the Lord, he finds out that she's with child, and, and no doubt some a range of emotions and a range of thoughts came through his head. The Bible says, while he thought on these things, the understatement of the year, while you thought on these things, can you imagine the stress in Joseph's life? He has, I'm sure, felt betrayed, and no matter what Mary has said, all right, he doesn't believe her. That's why the Bible says he minded to put her away privately. He didn't believe her that it was the Holy Ghost. Why would you? Never happened before, never happened since. This is not the devil made me do it. This was God did this. Can you imagine to her parents and, and to Joseph, this is from the Holy Ghost. The angel came down. Okay, Mary, just be honest with me. We can work through this, all right? I can forgive you, but, but you got to be honest. I am being honest. The angel came down and he said this, Mary... While he thought on these things, can you imagine the, the public disgrace? Eventually, everyone's going to know. You can't hide a pregnant woman. And if you did hide her for the whole time, eventually she's going to walk around with a little baby. Right? This is not going to be concealable. This is going to be a public disgrace. I believe later on, even in Jesus' life, that when they infer that Jesus is illegitimate. They're referring back to this stigma that has followed Jesus. No one believed that Jesus was from the Holy Ghost, except for Mary and later on Joseph. Public disgrace. It was humiliating. It appeared to be hopeless to Joseph. Put her away privately. I noticed that Joseph did not become bitter to peers, did not become spiteful. He wasn't running her name down in town. Well, I don't know about Mary, but I've been doing right. Don't know about that woman over there, but I've been doing the right thing. And I noticed that Joseph's not doing that. It's a, uh, it's a terrible, it's seemingly terrible situation. And there seems to be no hope in this situation for Joseph. It's easy to get caught up in our situations, get distracted by our circumstances, like Joseph was in this one, while he thought on these things. I wonder if Joseph began to compare like we do sometimes. Compare our situation to someone else's. Boy, if I was in that one, I then could follow God, but Lord, you've stuck me in this one. Lord, if you gave me that set of parameters in that particular situation, those circumstances, I could follow you, I could obey you, but the one you put me in over here is just too hard. Joseph, I don't think compared, I don't think Joseph was complaining. What do we do when we're in a tough spot? And publicly and privately, it seems like a mess. This was a mess of a situation outwardly. It was a mess as Joseph was there. But I noticed not only a public disgrace, I noticed some providential direction. You see, God did not leave Joseph alone in this situation. God did not leave Joseph just to figure it out all by himself. God did not leave Joseph there just to work his way through it and just figure out and, and figure out a way to solve it. No, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Verse number 20. 
In the midst of a struggle, God sent some direction. In the midst of a stressful night, the angel of the Lord came down. In the time of anxiety and consternation and agony, God providentially provided direction. And my friend, I'm here to tell you that in the midst of your situation that seems at times to be hopeless, God has provided providentially direction right here. Joseph had an angel of the Lord come down. We don't need an angel of the Lord because we have God's holy word. Peter says uh, later on in the New Testament that he heard the voice of prophecy, he heard the voice of God on the mount, the mount of transfiguration. And Peter says, even though I heard that voice, the voice that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, there was no doubt in their minds it was the voice of God. I don't know what exactly it sounded like, but they did not think that someone had snuck up behind them on the mountain. They did not look around, oh, who else is here? They knew it was the voice of God. And Peter says, though we heard that voice, we, through God's word, have a more sure word of prophecy. Something that is more consistent, more stable. You know what happened if, we, if God just t- talked to us in dreams? We would eventually begin to doubt a little bit. We'd remember at first, but a year later, was that really what God said? Or was I just imagining with God's word, we can go back to it. We can go back to it. We can go back to it. You see, God sent some providential direction. And I believe that God gave two ideas here to Joseph. He said, first of all, Joseph, thou son of David. He said, Joseph, I know who you are. The God of the universe knows who you are. That's not a scare or a scary thing. It is a comforting thing. He hasn't forgot about you. He hasn't forgot about me. He knows our name. He knows who you are in the midst of your situation that may be tough, that may be full of anxiety and consternation. God knows who you are. I read about a story of two women who had the same first, middle, and last name, were born on the exact same day, and were given the same social security number. Both had a father named Robert. Both studied cosmetology. Both worked as bookkeepers. And both had children ages 21 and 19. It sounds like a cruel story. Finally, they convinced the IRS and the Social Security Administration that Patricia Ann Campbell of Oregon was not the same person as Patricia Ann Campbell of Colorado. And I'm glad that I have a Heavenly Father who never gets confused. That He knows what day I was born on and, and if someone was born the same day with the same name and even the same social security number, my heavenly father knows who I am. He knows what I'm going through. He knows my name. He knows who you are. We see that throughout the Bible in the book of Exodus. God appears to Moses in the burning bush. And the first thing that God says to Moses, Moses was not take off your shoes. The first thing that God said to Moses was Moses, Moses. God knew his name. Samuel was laying in bed one night, and God called out to him. You know what God said? He didn't say, Samuel, I'm going to make you a great prophet, though God did that. Samuel, I'm going to reveal myself to you in ways that no one else during this time will see, though he did that. Samuel, I'm going to use you in a powerful and mighty way to anoint the first king, though he did that. The first thing God said was, Samuel. Cornelius was a soldier, a military man. He was a devout man, the Bible says. He was an Italian in the Italian band. He feared God with all his house, the Bible says, and he gave much alms. He was a generous man. He prayed to God. In the ninth hour, God showed up. And the first thing that God said to him was Cornelius. My friend, when this angel came to Joseph, 
first thing that the angel said to Joseph was Joseph. We can obey God because God knows who we are. Not only does he know who we are, he says something next, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary. Not only does God say, I know who you are, but he says, Joseph, I know where you are. Joseph, I know what you're feeling right now. Joseph, I know the situation you're in. Joseph, I know what, what you're looking at right now. You see, Joseph had a problem. He only saw two options. Put her away privately or put her away publicly. And God said, Joseph, I'm going to give you option number three. Marry the girl. Joseph, I'm going to give you the option that you need to take. Marry this wonderful girl who, by the way, he's going to find out, has found favor in the sight of God. Joseph, marry Mary. And Joseph, in that dream, saw that angel. You see, God always makes the next step clear for you and for me. It may not be when you want to hear it. It may not be how you want to hear it. It may not be the why you want to hear, and it may sometimes not even be what you want to hear. But God makes that next step plain. I see a public disgrace. I see, I see a providential direction, but lastly tonight, very quickly, I see a purposeful decision. I love verse 24 and 25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. I don't see any delay right now. I see a lack of questioning, a lack of delaying, and a lack of self. Joseph got up and he said, yes, sir. I don't think it was too hard for Joseph in one sense because he no doubt loved Mary. Uh, no doubt, no, there was some public disgrace there. It wasn't like, oh, no, I got to marry an ugly one. No, I get to marry my sweetheart. And while there may be something going on here, the angel has told me what Mary's told me, he said. And Lord, I'll just obey you. Can I tell you, my friend, obey it when it seems all, all dark around you. Obey when there's maybe a cloud of suspicion. Obey in a time when, when it doesn't seem to make sense. Obey because God has directed you. Joseph obeyed God. He just obeyed it. It was a Sunday school Christmas pageant. And one boy really wanted to be Joseph. But when the parts were handed out, another boy got to be Joseph. And he was assigned to be the innkeeper instead. He was upset. He didn't tell anything to the director or anyone else. He just let it kind of fester. Through all the rehearsals, he, he pondered how he, he thought about how he could get back at his rival who got the part of Joseph. It was the night of the Christmas pageant. He, the innkeeper, and his rival, Joseph. Joseph knocked on his door, and he, the innkeeper, threw the door open. And Joseph said, we'd like to have a room for the night. And suddenly it hit the innkeeper what he could do. He threw the door wide open. Great, come on in. I'll give you the best room in the house. He thought, I have him now. He'll never be able to get out of this one. Oh, but little Joseph that night... For a few seconds, didn't know what to do. But thinking quickly on his feet, he looked around inside, past the door of the innkeeper and said, no wife of mine is going to stay in a dump like this. Come on, honey, we're going to the barn. <laughs> and once again, the play was back on track. Um, but Joseph just had to follow what God told him to do. The person that Joseph first thought had cheated on him gave herself to another it's the one that God told him to marry. The one that Joseph loved, the one he was worried about having to face the wrath and public humiliation, it was the one that the, the angel said to Mary, the dilemma that Joseph faced in his dream. And what's amazing is that Joseph immediately obeyed. As far as we know, he didn't ask any questions. He didn't say, Lord, can you wrap that around one more time? Lord, I need a few more questions answered. He just said, I'll do it. He didn't say, boy, I need you to fill in all the details. He just obeyed it. When it seemed hard and people gave sideway glances, he just obeyed. 
on his way to pay the taxes. He just obeyed as they gave birth to the baby Jesus. The Bible says this. The last, the last few words of verse 25. And he, that is Joseph, called his name Jesus. Maybe the greatest thing he ever did was have the privilege of assigning on earth the name given to him from God the Father. He obeyed, and I can think of no greater joy than to be able to say, I fulfilled my part and called his name Jesus. My friend, tonight, it may seem like a tough situation. It may seem that you're misunderstood. It may seem that there's no way up, down, left, or right. My friend, God will make it clear. And he'll usually just make the next step clear. He didn't tell Joseph all that happened. He just said, Joseph, marry her. That's it. And Joseph just said, yes, sir, and obeyed it. Been to camp many times with the young people. Throughout the years at camp, it never ceases to amaze me when I hear this type of phrase, teenagers. You know what? God's been dealing with me for a long time about and they'll fill in something. They normally go to camp knowing what God wanted them to do. And I would submit, adult, that normally we know God has made clear what we're supposed to do. What we need to do is take the response of Joseph and apply it and just obey it. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for Joseph and how you used him to show us a tremendous and great and powerful truth. Lord, I ask you to help us to once we know what you want us to do, Lord, to take that next step and obey you. Lord, we're quick to make excuses, to give reasons why we don't have to. It doesn't apply to us. But Lord, with you, there are no excuses. Lord, you know our name. You know where we're at. Lord, you have a perfect plan for us. I wonder who tonight would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. Holy Spirit touched my heart. The fact is, if I'm going to be honest, there's something that God said I need to do. Maybe he's been saying it for a long time, my friend. But he would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? God spoke to me. Would you pray for me that I would be just like Joseph and obey it? Who would say, that's me? Would you pray for me tonight? Amen. Amen. Who else? Hands all over. Who else? Who else? God has been speaking to me. Maybe he spoke to you tonight. Maybe he's been speaking to you for a while. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Let's see now. Who else? Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. Amen. Oh, we can learn a lot from Joseph. We think we have it bad. It was tough for him. Simple faith and obedience. Lord, bless his invitation. Lord, those who have mentioned by an upraised hand that you've spoken to them, may they respond. May they obey and follow you. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, would they tonight, Lord, step out in the altar and come up, and we'd love to show them from the Bible how God loves them, and your son Jesus died on the cross to save their sins. Lord, bless his invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.